Chapter Fifty Five of the Mystery of the Ravenspurs by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifty Five A Shock for the Princess. It was not a pleasant task, but it had to be done. Fortunately, it was possible to do everything discreetly and in order, for the vaults were large, and there was not the slightest chance that any of the household would come near. The bodies were laid out there, and the key turned upon them. Geoffrey looked at his companions and inquired what was to be done next. "'Inform the head of the house and send for the police,' Chigorsky said. So far as I can see, it will be impossible to keep the matter a secret. Nor are we to blame. Those men came here for no good purpose, and we took steps to prevent them from entering the house. Unfortunately, we forgot there would be an exceptionally high tide today, and consequently they have paid the penalty of their folly. But we can't bury these two fellows as we did the others." "'Hadn't we better search them?' Ralph suggested. "'They came in response to the note sent them by their mistress. "'The note was opened and read. "'One of them is sure to have the letter on his person.' "'Then let the police find it,' Chigorsky said promptly. "'It will be the link in the evidence that we require. "'When you and I come to tell our story, Ralph, "'and the police find that letter, the net around Princess Zara will be complete. I have only to produce that diary, and the case is finished." Ralph nodded approval. Five minutes later and the head of the house, seated over a book in the library, was exceedingly astonished to see Ralph and Geoffrey, followed by Tchigorsky, enter the room. He swept a keen glance over their faces. He saw at once they had news of grave import for him. "'I do not understand,' he said. "'Dr. Chigorsky, I am amazed. I was under the impression that you were dead and buried.' "'Other people shared the same opinion, sir,' Chigorsky said coolly. "'The great misfortune of another man was my golden opportunity.' It was necessary for certain people to regard me as dead, your enemies particularly. But perhaps I had better explain." "'It would be as well,' Ravenspur murmured. Chigorsky proceeded to clear the mystery of Vosky's death. He had to tell the whole story, beginning at Lhasa and going on to the end. Ravenspur listened with the air of a man who dreams. To a man used all his life to the quiet life of an English shire, it seemed impossible to believe that such things could be. And why should these people persecute him? Why should they come here? What did those men mean by drowning themselves in the vaults? "'They came here at the instigation of Mrs. May,' Chigorsky said. "'But I don't see how that lady comes to be in it at all.' "'You will in a minute,' said Tchigorsky grimly. "'You will when I tell you that Mrs. May and Princess Zara are one and the same person.' Ravenspur gasped. The bare idea of having such a woman under his roof filled him with horror. Even yet he could not understand his danger. "'But why does she come?' he demanded. "'For revenge on you two? Oh, no! My being here was a mere coincidence. Of course the princess would have removed me sooner or later. Ralph, strange to say, she does not recognize at all, possibly because he has disguised himself with such simple cleverness. Princess Zara came here to destroy your family. In the name of heaven, why? Partly for revenge, partly for money. I told you all about her husband, who was an English officer. I told you why she had married him. 
when she discovered the papers she wanted then she killed him in return to her own people giving out that she and her husband had perished up country in a fearful cholera epidemic she wanted money why not kill off her husband's family one by one so that finally the estate should come to her mr ravenspur surely you have guessed who was the english officer princess zara married ravenspur staggered back as before a heavy blow the illuminating flash almost stunned him he fell gasping into a chair my son jasper he said hoarsely that fiend is his widow and marion's mother ralph croaked geoffrey was almost as much astonished as his grandfather he wondered why he had not seen all this before once explained the problem was ridiculously simple ravenspur covered his face with his hands marion must not know he said it would kill her she knows already tchigorsky said that woman has great influence over her child and the idea was for the child to get everything the others were to be killed off until she was the only one left with this large fortune at command zara meant to be another queen of sheba and she would have succeeded too ravenspur shuddered he was torn by conflicting emotions perhaps tenderness and sympathy for marion were uppermost how much did she know how much had she guessed was she entirely in the dark as to her mother's machinations or had she come resolved to protect the relatives as much as possible ravenspur poured out these questions one after another Chigorsky could or would say nothing to relieve the other's feelings on these points. "'What you ask has nothing to do with the case,' he said. "'I have proved to you, I am prepared to prove in any court of law, how your family has been destroyed and who is the author of the mischief. She is under your roof, where she is powerless to move.' Her two confederates lie dead in the vaults yonder. I have already explained to you how it came about that the princess is here and how her infernal apparatus failed. It now remains to call in the police. There will be a fearful scandal, Ravenspur groaned. Tchigorsky glanced at him impatiently. The cosmopolitan knew a great many things that were sealed books to Ravenspur. In point of knowledge, it was as a child alongside a great master. But Tchigorsky knew nothing of family pride. "'Which will be forgotten in a week,' he said emphatically. "'And when the thing is over, you will be free again. You cannot realize what that means as yet.' "'No.' ravenspur said i cannot nevertheless you can see for yourself that what i say is a fact tchigorsky resumed and as a country magistrate and a deputy lieutenant you would hardly venture to suggest that we should bury those bodies and say nothing to anybody about it ravenspur nodded approval a few minutes later a groom was carrying a note to the police inspector at Alton. Ravenspur turned to Tchigorsky with a manner more genial than he usually assumed. "'I have forgotten to thank you,' he said. "'And you, Ralph, have saved the house. If you can forget the past—' He said no more, but his hand went out. Ralph seemed to divine it and pressed it closely. There was no word uttered on either side, but they both understood, and Ralph smiled. Geoffrey had never seen his uncle smile before. The expression on his face was genial, almost handsome. His wooden look had utterly disappeared, and nobody ever saw it again. 
the transformation of ralph ravenspur was not the least wonderful incident of the whole mysterious affair the door opened and vera came lightly into the room what does all this mystery mean she asked geoffrey you are dr tchigorsky the last words came with a scream that might have been heard all over the house tchigorsky closed the door and proceeded rapidly to explain but it was not the full explanation he had given to the others there was time enough for that vera was too bewildered to ask questions at a sign from geoffrey she slipped from the room then she recollected that she had come downstairs on an errand of mercy she promised to get a cup of tea for the woman whom she still knew as mrs may she procured the tea from the drawing-room and in a dazed kind of state made her way up the stairs again mrs may was sitting up in bed there was a pink spot on either cheek and her dark eyes were blazing i hope nothing is wrong she said it might have been my fancy but it seems to me that i heard you call tchigorsky's name at the top of your voice the suggestion was made with a fervent earnestness that the woman could not repress but vera did not notice it i did she said i walked into the library hearing voices there and in a chair dr tchigorsky was seated no wonder that i cried out it was a fearful shock and when he began to talk i could not believe the evidence of my senses then who was it that was buried the woman asked the question mechanically she knew perfectly well what the reply would be she knew that she had been discovered at last and that the murder of vosky had been turned to good purpose by tchigorsky and she knew now who her new ally ben here really was dr vosky vera explained i have been hearing all about lassa and a certain princess zara who seems to be a dreadful wretch but i fear that i am exciting you and you haven't drunk your tea the woman gulped down her tea and then fell back on her bed closing her eyes she wanted to be alone to have time to think danger had threatened her before but not living palpitating peril like this vera crept away and the woman rose again but she could not get from her bed passionate angry tears filled her eyes that man has beaten me she groaned it is finished for good and all but their revenge will not be of a long duration end of chapter 55chapter fifty six of the mystery of the ravenspurs by fred m white this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifty six marion comes back the police had more or less taken possession of ravenspur they were everywhere asking questions that tchigorsky took upon himself to answer as he had expected the note carried by vera and deposited in the farmhouse garden had been found on one of the bodies the inspector of police was an intelligent man and he fell in with everything that tchigorsky suggested of course you can't read this book said the russian as he handed over the fateful diary for safe custody but there are one or two oriental scholars in london who will bear out my testimony have you any doubt personally not the least the inspector replied you say it is impossible for that woman to get away absolutely impossible she is safe for days then in that case there is no need to arrest her that will have to come after the inquest of these men which we shall hold tomorrow 
and what a sensation the case will make. If I had read this thing in a book, I should have laughed at it. And now we must have a thorough search for those electrical appliances. It was long past dinner time before the police investigations were finished. Aided by Tchigorsky, a vast amount of mechanical appliances was found, including the apparatus that was to do so much harm to the Ravenspurs, and which had ended in wrecking the schemes of their arch-enemy. "'Inquest at ten tomorrow, sir,' the inspector remarked to Ravenspur. "'I am very sorry, but we shall not trouble you more than we can help.' Ravenspur shook his head sadly. He was not particularly versed in the ways of the law, but he could see a long case ahead, and he was beginning to worry about Marion. It was nearly ten o'clock now, and the girl had not returned. It would be a sad homecoming for the girl, but they would all do what they could for her. Everybody appeared to be duly sympathetic, except Ralph, who said nothing. Tchigorsky seemed to have obliterated himself entirely. Geoffrey had retired to the billiard room, where Vera followed him. They started a game, but their nerves were in no condition to finish it. Cues were flung down, and the lovers stood before the fireplace. "'What are you thinking about?' Geoffrey asked. Vera looked up dreamingly. She touched Geoffrey's cheek caressingly. She looked like one who is happy and yet at the same time ashamed of her own happiness. "'Of many things, pleasant and otherwise,' she said. "'I am still utterly in the dark myself, but those who know tell me that the shadow has lifted forever. That in itself is so great a joy that I dare not let my mind dwell upon it as yet. To think that we may part and meet again, to think... But I dare not let my mind dwell upon that. But what has Mrs. May to do with it? Vera was not behind the scenes as yet. Still, within a few hours, the thing must come out. What the family regarded as a nurse had been procured for the invalid, a nurse who really was a female warder in disguise, and Ravenspur had sternly given strict orders that nobody was to go near that room. He vouchsafed no reason why. He gave the order, and it was obeyed. Then Geoffrey told Vera everything. He went through the whole story from the very beginning. Vera listened as one in a dream. Such wickedness was beyond her comprehension. Awful as the cloud was that had long hung over the house of Ravenspur, Vera had not imagined it to be lined with such depravity as this. "'And so that inhuman wretch is Marion's mother?' said Vera. "'The child of a creature who deliberately murdered a husband and tried to destroy his family so that she could get everything into her hands?' No wonder that Marion has been a changed creature since this Mrs. May has been about. How I pity her anguish and condition of mind! But had Marion a sister? Not that I ever heard of. Why? I was thinking of that other girl, the girl so like Marion that you were talking about just now. What has become of her? Geoffrey shook his head. He had forgotten that most mysterious personage. It was more than likely, he explained, that Tchigorsky would know. Not that it much mattered. The two were silent for some little time. Then a peal of laughter from the drawing-room caused them to smile. "'My mother,' said Vera, "'I have not heard her laugh like that for years. Does it not seem funny to realize that before long we shall be laughing and chatting and moving with the world once more, Jeff. I should like to leave Ravenspur and have a long, long holiday on the continent. Geoffrey stooped and kissed her. So you shall, sweet, he said. 
we can be married now and when we come back to ravenspur it will be the dear old home i recollect in my childhood's days vera you and i shall be the happiest couple in the world they went back to the drawing-room again here the elders were conversing quietly yet happily there was an air of cheerful gaiety upon them that the house had not known for many a long day gordon ravenspur was impressing upon his father the necessity of looking more sharply after the shooting the head of the family had before him some plans of new farm buildings it was marvelous what a change the last few hours had wrought and the author of all the sorrow and anguish was upstairs guarded by eyes that never tired how bright and cheerful you look vera said it only wants one thing to make the picture complete you can guess dear grandfather marion ravenspur said marion of course she will come back ralph murmured marion will return we know now that no harm could come to the girl i should not wonder if she were not on her way home this very moment half an hour passed an hour elapsed and yet no marion they were all getting uneasy but ralph who sat doggedly in his chair then there was a commotion outside the door opened and marion came in she looked pale and uneasy she glanced from one to the other with frightened eyes it was easy to see that she was greatly moved and moreover was not sure as to the warmth of her reception but she might have made her mind easy on that score all rose to welcome her my dear dear child vera cried where have you been vera fluttered forward and took off marion's cloak all seemed to be delighted marion dropped into a chair with quivering smile ralph had felt his way across to her and stood by the side of her chair i fancied i had made a discovery she said it occurred to me perhaps but don't let us talk about myself has anything happened here much ralph cried great things the mystery is solved solved marion gasped you have found the culprit the culprit is in the house she is mrs may i prefer to call her princess zara and yet again i might call her mrs ravenspur wife of the late jasper ravenspur marion we have found your mother marion said nothing her head had fallen forward and she sat swaying in her chair there was a hard yet pleading look in her eyes ralph bent down and drew her none too tenderly to her feet the she-wolf is yonder the cub is here he cried are you going to speak or shall i tell the story speak or let me do it ravenspur sprang forward angrily what are you doing he cried to lay hand on that angel ay said ralph an angel truly but a fallen one lucifer in the dust end of chapter 56chapter 57 of the mystery of the ravenspurs by fred m white this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 57 hand and foot what did it mean why was there all this commotion in the house and why did everybody leave her so severely alone these were the questions that princess zara otherwise mrs may otherwise mrs jasper ravenspur asked herself and why had marion not returned 
oh it was bitter to lie there fettered hand and foot at the very moment when activity and cunning and action were most imperatively needed and tchigorsky was not dead how she had been tricked and fooled fate had played against her who would have anticipated that Vosky would have come to Ravenspur and met his death there? By this time the sham Ben here had all necessary proofs in his hands. The door opened and a resolute-looking woman came in. Her garb was something of the hospital type, yet more severe and plainer. She came in and took her place with the air of one who watches a prisoner. I do not require your services, the adventuress said coldly. It is immaterial, madam, was the equally cold reply. I am sent here to do my duty whether you require my services or not. Indeed? Am I to regard myself as a prisoner, then? The other bowed. The bolt had fallen. There was nothing for it but to submit quietly. By this time Tchigorsky's proofs were in possession of the police. The prisoner smiled grimly as she thought how she could escape her foes yet. "'What is the confusion in the house?' she asked. "'What is your name?' "'My name is Simmons. I was fetched here by the inspector of police.' The bodies of two Asiatics have been found drowned in the vaults, and they are getting ready for the inquest tomorrow. Once again the defeated murderess smiled. Fate was all against her. Those men had come to do her bidding and had perished. Doubtless the note sent by Vera Ravenspur would be found on one of them, and this would be no more than another link in the long chain. She tried to rise, but she could not. She lay on the bed fully dressed. Her brain was as quick and as clear as ever, but the paralysis in her lower limbs fettered her. A blind fury shook her for the moment. If she had only been free to move, she would have triumphed even yet. Tchigorsky might have been a clever man, but she would have shown him that he was no match for her and now she had walked into the trap he had laid for her. Doubtless she had been watched into the castle. Doubtless the enemy had seen her lay those wires, and had arranged to give her a taste of that deadly stuff she had prepared for others. Then Marion had been spirited away, and the key of the safe taken from her. Subsequently Tchigorsky had ransacked the box, Oh, she saw it all. The family of Ravenspur saw it all by this time, too. She was no longer a guest in the house of Ravenspur, but a prisoner in charge of a female warder. In a day or two she would be cast into prison. In due course she would undergo her trial and finally be hanged by the neck until she were dead. It was this last thought that caused her to smile. She was too clever a woman not to accept the inevitable. A great many people in her position would have protested and lied and blustered. She saw the folly of it. "'I should like to see Mr. Ravenspur,' she said. "'Will you tell him so? You need not fear. I am helpless. I could not move.' Mrs. Simmons stepped into the corridor and gave the message to a passing servant. After a time, a slow step came shuffling along up the stairs. It was Ralph who presently came into the room. "'You can leave us for a little time,' he said. Simmons discreetly disappeared. She passed into the corridor. The woman in the bed opened her mouth to speak but stopped in astonishment. Ralph's glasses were gone, and the smooth ungents had disappeared from his face. Those cruel criss-cross lines stood out with startling distinctness. "'You wanted to see my father?' 
he said. My father declines to see you in any circumstances. Perhaps I shall do as well. You, you are one of the men I saw at Lhasa. The words came from the woman's lips with a gasp. She had never been so astonished in all her life. Yes, I was the other one ralph said coolly i had to disguise myself when i found out you were in england there is no longer any need for disguise i hope you are delighted to see me my dear sister-in-law oh so you know that also you may take it for granted that i knew everything there was a long pause before the woman spoke again I need not ask what opinion you have formed of me. You are perhaps the most depraved wretch who ever drew the breath of life, said Ralph, slowly and without emotion. To your ambition and what you call your religion, you are prepared to sacrifice everything. You deliberately murdered the man who loved you. Your brother, Jasper, I admit it. Perhaps you will find it impossible to believe that I loved him. But I did with my whole heart and soul. I loved him, and I killed him. Does it not sound strange? But this is the fact. I had to do it, for the sake of my people and my religion, I had to do it. When I recovered those papers, I slew him, as he knew I would. He was the only thing on earth that I had to care for. Oh, had you not a daughter? The woman made a gesture of contempt. A poor creature, she said, but I brought her up in the strong faith I follow, and so she has not been without her uses. Not that she knows anything of the holy temple and the ceremonial there. I never told her about the two men who escaped along the Black Valley. If I had, I should have known you to be a worthy antagonist, instead of a half-witted fool, and then you would never have brought me to this pass. Oh, if I had only told her that! There was a passionate ring in the woman's voice. It was the first time during the interview that she had displayed any humanity. "'You didn't, and there is an end of it,' Ralph said. "'Go on.' "'Is there any need to go on? I have failed, and there is an end to the matter. When my husband died, my feelings were turned to rage and hatred of you all. "'Why should you all live and prosper while he was dead?' said Mrs. May. "'With your money I could do anything among my own people.' I could found a new dynasty. Did I not possess the occult knowledge of the East, with a thorough knowledge of what you are pleased to call Western civilization? I could do it. A little longer, and your wealth would have come to my child. In other words, it would have come to me. Do you understand what I mean? Perfectly. I have understood for some time. Before I returned to England, I had an idea of what was at the bottom of the vendetta. But you would not have succeeded. Tchigorsky and myself made up our minds that if we could not bring the crimes home to you, we would shoot you. Ralph spoke with a grim coldness that was not without its effect upon the listener. Hard as she was, the sentiment was after her own heart. "'That would have been murder,' she said. "'Perhaps so. In the cold, prosaic eyes of the law, we might have been regarded as criminals of the type you mention. But we did not propose to pay any deference to the law. Nor would our deed have been discovered. You would simply have disappeared. We should have shot you and thrown your body into the sea.' and I don't fancy that the deed would have weighed very heavily on the conscience of either of us." The woman smiled. Nothing seemed to disturb her. 
she was full of passionate fury against the decrees of fate but she did not show it i suppose you planned everything out she asked everything tchigorsky and myself between us it was Tchigorsky who rescued my nephew after your familiar in the blue dress and red hat had cut the mast and skulls. We guessed that the search for Geoffrey would empty the house and that you would take advantage of the fact. Geoffrey and I watched you laying those wires. It was I who saw that you had a taste of the poison. I wanted to lay you by the heels here while Tchigorsky overhauled your possessions. Your messenger was waylaid and robbed of your key. Also I opened the letter you sent by my niece so that your confederates might be summoned to your assistance. Marion has come back again? Within the last hour, yes. You will see her presently the woman smiled curiously not tonight she said not tonight i am tired and fancy i shall sleep well i shall be glad of a long long rest shall i see your father no ralph said sternly you certainly shall not then good night do not be surprised if i beat you yet it was late, and the family were retiring. Marion had already gone. In the drawing-room a group had gathered round the fire. They were silent and sad, for they had heard many things that had moved them strangely. There was a knock at the door, and Simmons looked in. "'My prisoner is dead,' she said coldly and unmoved. I suppose she managed to secret some poison and take it, but she is dead. It is well, Ravenspur replied. It might have been worse. It was the best she could do to lift the shadows of disgrace from this unhappy house. End of chapter 57「Chapter fifty eight of the Mystery of the Ravenspurs by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifty eight Lenvoy Marion had bowed her head before the coming storm. She asked no mercy and expected none, yet she looked the same pure, unaffected saint she had ever appeared. Ravenspur would have taken her hand, but she drew it away. "'It is true,' she said. "'I am a fallen angel. I have never been anything else. Put it down to my mother's training, if you like, but I came here as her friend, not yours. My religion is hers. My feelings are hers. I am of her people.' With all the wicked knowledge of the East, I came here to cut you off root and branch. Why? Ravenspur said brokenly. In the name of heaven, why? Because for years I have been taught to hate you. Because I am at heart an Asiatic. It would be grand to have all your money, so that I might be a great person in my own country some day. Then I came and brought the curse with me. It never seemed to strike any of you that the curse and I came together. Three deaths followed. In every one of these I played a part. I was responsible for them all. Shall I tell you how? No, no, said Ravenspur. Heavens, this is too horrible. To think of you looking so sweet and so fair and good. To think that you should have crept into our hearts only to betray us like this. We want to hear nothing beyond your confession. Have you a heart at all, or are you a beautiful fiend? I did not imagine that I had a heart at all until I came here, Marion replied. 
she had not abated a jot of her sweetness of expression or angelic manner then gradually i began to love you all when i met my cousin geoffrey i recognized the fact that i was a woman more than once i have been on the point of betraying myself to him but the more passion for him filled my heart the worse i felt i was going to kill you all off and keep geoffrey for myself if vera had died he would have come to care for me in time i know he would then my mother came i was not getting along fast enough for her her keen eyes saw into my breast and discovered my secret at once for that reason she marked geoffrey down for her next victim i tried to warn him i wrote him a letter and i had to do him to death myself it was i who cut the mast away it was i who sawed the skulls i was the girl in the blue dress amazing geoffrey murmured to think of it marion marion there were tears in his eyes he could not be angry with her there were tears in the eyes of everybody vera was crying softly and all the grief was as so many daggers in the heart of the unhappy girl go on she said cry for me every look of pity and every sign of grief stings me to the quick perhaps i am mad perhaps i am not responsible for my actions but i swear that all the time i have been plotting against your lives i have cared for you only my training in my religion forced me on call me insane if you please as you say of the fakir who sleeps upon a bed of sharp nails i could explain all the mysteries you need not ralph said i can do that in good time from the first i knew you from the first i have dogged you from room to room at night and frustrated your designs then came tchigorsky who finished the task for me need i say more marion moved towards the door the imploring look had gone from her face her eyes had grown sad and hopeless and yet in the face of her confession in the face of the knowledge of her crimes not one of them had the slightest anger for her i am going she said in the event of this happening i had made my plans it may be that i shall have to take my trial it may be that i shall be spared one thing you may be certain of my mother will never stand in the dock ralph rose and slipped quietly from the room if she dies if anything happens to her marion went on it may be possible to spare me nobody knows anything to my dishonor outside the family but dr tchigorsky and you can rely upon his silence if my mother is no more there need be no scandal farewell farewell to you all oh if heaven had been good to me and sent me here as a little child then what a happy life might have been mine she passed out of the room and nobody made any attempt to detain her it was a long long time before anybody spoke and no voice was raised above a whisper the shock was stupendous in none of their past sorrows and troubles had their feelings been more outraged the cloud lay heavy upon them all it would be a long while before it passed away ravenspur rose at length his face white and worn we can do no good here he said perhaps sleep will bring us merciful relief it was at this moment that simons looked in with her information it was no shock because all were past being shocked vera cried on geoffrey's shoulder i am glad of it she whispered 
It's an awful thing to say, but I am glad. It saves Marion. We shall never see her again, but I am glad she is saved. A young couple were looking down on the Mediterranean from the terrace of an old garden filled with the choicest flowers. The man looked bronzed and well, the girl radiantly happy. For grief has no abiding place in the eyes of youth. "'Doesn't it seem wonderful, Geoffrey? the girl said. "'Positively I cannot realize that we have been married three weeks. I shall wake up presently and find myself back at Ravenspur again, wondering what dreadful thing is going to happen next.' Geoffrey touched a letter that lay in Vera's lap. "'Here is the evidence of our freedom,' he said. "'Read it to me, please.' Vera picked up the letter. There was no heading. Then she read, "'I am near you and yet far off. I hear little things from the world from time to time, and I know that you are married to Geoffrey. I felt that I must write you a few lines. I am in a convent here, in a convent from whence I can never emerge again. Heaven knows how many human tragedies are bound up in these gray old walls. But of all the miserable wretches here, there is none more miserable than myself. Still, in my new faith I have found consolation. I know that there is hope even for sinners as black as myself. Will it sound strange to you to hear that I long and yearn for you always, that I still love those whom I would have destroyed? I meant to write you a long letter, but my heart is too full. Do not reply, because we are not allowed to have letters here. Heaven bless you both and give you the happiness you deserve. Marion. Geoffrey took up the letter and tore it into minute fragments. The gentle breeze carried it over the oleanders and lemon trees like snow. Down below the blue sea sparkled, and the world seemed full of the pure delight of life. Geoffrey, Vera said after a long pause, are we too happy? Is it possible to be too happy? Geoffrey replied. Well, too selfishly happy, I mean. It seems awful to be so blissful when Marion is full of misery. I shall never feel anything but affection for her. It seems a strange thing to say, but I mean it. Poor Marion! Geoffrey stooped and kissed the quivering lips. "'Poor Marion, indeed,' he said. "'Marion was two distinct persons. Of all the shocks we ever had, her confession hurt me most of all. A creature so sweet and pure and good, a veritable angel. It is sufficient to utterly destroy one's faith in human nature.' It would, if I hadn't got you. The End End of Chapter 58 End of The Mystery of the Ravenspurs by Fred M. White Recording by Roger Moline